We are all vulnerable. To live in this world and be human is to be vulnerable. Whether we are located in the path of harm, as when we're in the outer banks during hurricane season, or whether we're living in a neighborhood beside a freight train line that carries toxic chemicals, or we live with an underlying health condition, or maybe we're of a certain age, or never thought that a loved one could have a heart attack at such an early age, or that we would never have to figure out how to live in downtown Richmond for 10 days without electricity. We never thought that we'd live without any air traffic across the globe for a whole number of days, five, six, seven. Or that a pandemic would strike and keep us in our homes for days and weeks on end, and the only reason we could go out was for absolute necessities. We never thought that would happen. Let me give you an example of vulnerability that you might appreciate in your day-to-day -day lives. Think about a job that you no longer have. Many of you are retired, at least some of you, so this should be easy. Cast back. Those of us who have retired make this easier. A letter from your organization where you work arrives in the U.S. mail postmarked from human resources. Or an official email arrives in your email box postmarked, the return is human resources, and it notes that delivery receipt and opening will be noted for the record. Or your boss calls you into the office, says, please have a seat and close the door behind you on your way in. In that moment when you're closing the door or opening the letter or opening the email, finding a seat on the couch in front of the boss, opening, sitting on your own couch, sitting at your workstation, suddenly you find that the blood is drained from your face, your blood pressure has plummeted, and you feel nauseous. Suddenly you're going to be out of a job on some day certain, on some date. Whether you are being fired or let go or the subject and victim of downsizing, a casualty of larger economic forces, something out of control for you or your organization like COVID, it does not matter because everything that you had that was important with that job is now gone. Next thing you do when you're finished with this boss or reading the letter or reading the email, maybe you do run to the bathroom and get sick or weep or run outside and scream at the injustice of the world. So three things have happened here and are going to happen. One is first you respond. Maybe you respond well, maybe not. Then you recover for some, to some extent. You re the blood returns to your face, your blood pressure rises, you regain at least a little bit of composure, you're able to move, and finally, step three, you move on. And that's where we discover the true meaning of what resilience is at a personal level. Someone, maybe a friend or family member says, come on, you've got to get on with your life. You can't just wallow in misery. You've got to move on. Your therapist, hopefully you've got one by this time, <laughs> if you don't, well, they offer some insights and get you think about you it's all about what's in your head and what you're going to do. So that's where it, where it goes and where it comes from. There are two obvious strategies that you might be considering. The first one is, I will never be hurt this way again. Really? No more jobs? No more loves? No more friends? No, that's not going to work. Or, as Alfred Lord Tennyson said, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." And maybe that's a little bit closer. Moving on after an assault or harm and rebuilding your new life is essentially resilience. The definition that I have of resilience is the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize 
while undergoing change, while, while you can still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedback. Yeah, it's a little scientific, but I'm a geek. <laughs> it's not bouncing back, it's bouncing forward, getting on better, growing beyond adversity. Let me show you an image of a, a resilient system. Look outside. Look outside at the woodlands. Look outside at the trees growing there that were once dominated by chestnut trees all along the East Coast. They're gone. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> you can come back. Gary. Gary! So chestnut trees had to be replaced with something and the forest replaced them with other hardwood trees, with oaks and maples, and I'm afraid sweet gum in the south here. <laughs> the first I ever gave serious thought to what um, resilience was, was in this project that I referred to earlier when a group of scientists were looking at how vulnerabil vulnerability plays into environmental protection. And as a, as a matter of looking into vulnerability, as geeky scientists get to talking about these things, we said, well, you know, this is really the flip side of resilience. The non-vulnerable systems and people are the ones that are able to rise above. They are able to be resilient. When Katrina slammed into the Gulf Coast, the loss, the loss of life and property was just immense. When we looked at this as an example, because it happened as we were finishing our paper, and we all looked at what happened and said, that's vulnerability. That's what happens when you have a community that's vulnerable. So we learned, number one, the community was central to these sort of things, and we learned the complexity and the depth of this vulnerability, and hence, of resilience. Transportation systems in New Orleans and the Gulf were weak. General health status across several states, but especially in southern Louisiana, was poor. Communication was not well developed. The populace, the community, was not prepared by their leaders for any of these things, and there were a number of social systems that had not been strengthened. They were weakened, in part because of some of the intrinsic things that have gone on there. These factors that increase their vulnerability and reduce their resilience include inadequate health care, insufficient transportation, insufficient communication systems, and lack of trust in their leaders. The community had not been informed, they hadn't been prepared, and it wasn't just the city of New Orleans. That was the example that all of us had. So a few years later, I was teaching a graduate class and brought up this question of vulnerability and resilience as the flip side to it, when in August of 2012, another hurricane struck a different coast. New Jersey was struck just north of Atlantic City by Hurricane Sandy. Now, albeit a smaller, less intense hurricane, but devastating nonetheless. And it moved on to a bigger city, New York. So what happened there? A lot different response. Why? Because they had these characteristics of resilience. So I'm going to talk here a bit about what the elements of resilience are for you and me as individuals and as communities. But first I need to say something about vulnerability that doesn't have an exact counterpart in resilience because it's been an important part of my life and it's been an important part of this church as well. It's being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, the first example I thought about this had nothing to do with our church. The small town of Grundy in the mountains of Virginia kept getting flooded over and over again. And what did they do? They moved the town, lock, stock, and barrel, out of the floodplain. That's resilience. <laughs> that was resilience because they were vulnerable just because of where they were. It wasn't anything they were particularly doing. In fact, it was generations, many generations before that had put that town in that place. East Palestine, Ohio. Palestine, Ohio suffers from being in a place 
and that makes them vulnerable because of the freight line going through their town. Numerous communities in Ukraine didn't expect to be attacked because they are in Ukraine. A number of years ago in the late 1980s, the uh, communities of eastern North Carolina were in the path of toxic chemicals from emissions and waste disposal. A radical environmental group took this on and investigated the relationship between um, environmental justice, environmental discrimination, and these releases. That radical environmental group was the United Church of Christ. Whoa. Charles Lee headed that up, and he was the first director of the Office of Environmental Justice created by President Clinton in 1994 with his executive order. We can think of some other places that are dominated by non-white residents that are discriminated against, and that's what we're talking about with systemic racism. It's because that community has not received the same level of resources and attention, and they are vulnerable because of that. So let me talk a bit about just the resilience components. There's a couple of things that we th think about here. One of them is resist. How well are you able to keep that virus from getting to you? How well are you able to not have a car accident, to not have something happen to your house, to not suffer from whatever it is? And then what's your first response? What, how do you deal with it? How does your community deal with it? Is your community in disarray? Is it organized? Does it have leaders? And then how do you recover? How do you build forward, build back? And I was reminded just the other day of how New York City built back its infrastructure after the blizzard of 1888 dumped 55 inches of snow in a matter of two days. On the 10th of March, it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and on the 11th of March, the snow came. So what did they do? They put their infrastructure underground and out of harm's way. That's resilience. On the West Coast, the city of Seattle has instituted earthquake protection measures at the building level as well as at the community level so that the last time they had a major earthquake just south of Seattle, the person who died suffered from a heart attack and they have no reason to believe it was necessarily connected to the earthquake. No buildings fell, nobody was harmed, and it was a major earthquake. I don't remember the number, 7.5, 8, it was substantial. I was there. People knew what to do. The community was prepared, the buildings were prepared, they knew exactly what to do. Everybody down under a table, don't move, don't go. They'd been through training, just like we do fire drills, right? Well, a little different than that. The ground doesn't shake when we do fire drills or when we have anything else going on, but they knew exactly what they did. And there was a designated captain and leader who called the all clear and said, okay, everybody out, single file, out this door, not that one. That's preparedness, that's resilience. How do we do it as individuals and can help with our communities? Number one, we stay healthy. I mean, physically healthy, you know, like go to the doctor healthy. And your doctor can tell you all the things that you need to do if you don't know it by now. Sleep, what you eat, your exercise, all of those things, your medicines, your vaccinations. I've said that before, haven't I? I might say it again. Communities also have these same features about clinics, the availability of clinics, the number of doctors, how well they're trained. Are the doctors trusted? Are they believed? Do the healthcare professionals interact with the community in such a way that the community comes to them and gets their healthcare and their information? A key element in today's world is the availability and access to clinics and medicine and all the healthcare stuff and information. Information is key here and we have seen in the last three years the consequences of having leaders who are not 
well prepared, who have no idea what public health is, and instead they lied to their community. They lied to their community, and one of the results is increasing mortality and disease in those communities where their leaders lied to them about COVID. And those are the data. Geeky scientists that I am. Communities have, smaller communities have corresponding behaviors that take care of their people. Now, Reverend Kayla has often referred to, to spiritual practice for us. Your spiritual practice keeps you healthy. It's not just the physical health, and I'll refer a mention, I'll refer in a minute to how that happens, but it's your emotional health, it's your well-being, it's your stability, it's who you are. That's where your, your spiritual practice comes from and goes to. What do you do to keep you strong as a person, as your person? What did we do as a community? You know, we gathered. Now, during 2020 and 21, we didn't gather so much here, but we still did our best to see one another, to speak to one another. We Zoomed on Sunday morning. We Zoomed our community uh, committee meetings. We still held community me committee meetings. We had an auction. My goodness, we had an auction. We met outside when we could. I have a memory of being outside with that musician there in the back and that musician there and maybe that one too playing music at the picnic tables because we couldn't gather inside. So we did these things. Why? Because the connections, love, wonder, and connection, the connections make us a community and make us strong. The other thing that makes a community, particularly in this time, in this era, is transportation and mobility, the, the ability to get where you need to go and get where you go that keeps you strong and makes you who you are. We can and do move around not only to get our food and our clothing, but also to gather, to help people. We've done that always as a community. Who needs a ride to church? Who needs a ride to the doctor? Who needs a ride here, there, or yonder? We do that for ourselves. And if the community as a whole cannot do it for themselves, they do not have the same level of resilience. Virginia Emergency urges us to do these things that make us stronger and resilient, able to recover, able to resist. Strong and effective school systems, education and knowledge transfer is another key element. Rituals and practices are one way of passing along the information and have been for centuries, if not longer. We know that food gathering and food uh, provision has been not only a necessary part of health for Native American communities, it's a way to maintain their culture, to keep their community ties strong and well connected. We know these are true. And what is the result? The result is that there is a community that is well connected. So it's pretty clear from long-term health studies that this connection, love, wonder, connection, the connection part is not only good to make you smile, it makes you healthier, it makes you happier, and it helps you to live a longer life. And if you're healthy and happy, you want to, right? Now, I'm not just making this up, and this isn't just from the, guy, the people I worked with 17, 18 years ago, it's from an 85-year-long health investigation out of Harvard. And they found that the one most important determinant of people having a happy, healthy life, a health study that didn't focus on bad outcomes, yeah, and it's 85 years long. And what did they say? They said, warm, healthy relationships are the key, the key to a longer, happier, healthier, better life. Now they go through a lot of other sub-studies that demonstrate how stress hormones rise and make your system weak, or how warm relationships keep you calm and keep the stress hormones down. They even had one now, with, uh, with one that I just read about, that when you're having a difficult medical procedure, if someone holds your hand, it makes it easier for you. 
happened to me when I had to get a crown at the dentist office. And the, patting my shoulder, yeah, we're ready, yeah, Peter, yeah, you're fine, everything's good. Nice, soothing voice and a pat on the shoulder. It helps, it helps. Keeps your stress hormones down and it keeps your happiness hormones up. Yes, you do have happiness hormones, so don't look at me that way. Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz are the authors of this book that's recently been published, the end of last year, 2022. And the whole purpose was to look at what makes people happy over the years. What should most of, most of us have an idea how to build warm, stable, good relationships? And it is through personal connections. In person is best. The internet, Facebook, and emails are not the same as a phone call. They're not the same as sitting down for coffee or an adult beverage, that'll do too. We can and need to maintain our personal connections. And now that we're recovering from this pandemic that we've had, we need to do as much as we can. It builds a strong community. It builds a resilient community. Every get together, every committee meeting, every interaction is yet another brick in building the house of warm relationships. So that's what we need to do as we go forth. Let me leave you with just one final thought. The topic of resilience is the subject of people who are investigating it as scientists, social scientists, psychologists. What makes people resilient? So that they can not only get back to where they were, but get beyond that. Move on. And we hope to find and we look forward to receiving the results of those investigations. I'm going to give you, uh, leave you with the final words from another song that included resilience in it and recovery, written by the late Stan Rogers, a Canadian singer. And you to whom adversity has dealt the final blow with smiling rascals lying to you everywhere you go. Turn to, he was a sailor, put out all your strength of arm and heart and brain and rise again. Amen. May it be so. May we make it so.